All right, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to be able to uh, talk today. I um, work closely with Julie, and so I thank her for the invitation. Uh, as Scott mentioned, the title of my presentation today is on safe food sampling at farmers markets and other venues. And just a little background on um, what qualifies me to do the presentation today. Um, in 2014, the Minnesota Safe Food Sampling and Food Demonstration Law was passed into, um, our legislation was passed into law, and this allows the preparation and offering of food product um, sampling without um, requiring a food license to do so, and so that's also for um, sampling at um, different venues and also for food demonstrations as well. So as a result, um, we wanted to make sure that people were doing it safely. So we created a safe food sampling education training program. And all of our materials are available free on our University of Minnesota Extension Food Safety uh, website. And we created a four part series that's a recorded presentation, recorded presentation that you can take a peek at. And also we have a safe food sampling tips um, list and then a checklist too to make sure that uh, you're following safe food handling practices to um, sample food safely. And so today's topics, what I'm gonna um, talk about is, I did um, do some literature review on best practices for um, when, what, and where to offer food samples. And then I'll follow that up with best food safety practices for providing food samples. So let's start out with a definition on what is a food product sample. <clears throat> a food product sample is a free bite-sized portion of food or beverage, um, and really you're offering it to demonstrate its characteristics. Uh, the sample size is small, usually two to three ounce portions, and usually is contained in a single serving. And the main ingredient of that food product sample is something that you're promoting or selling. And um, it's usually, again, single service. So let's look at some sampling opportunities. So a farmer or grower may offer a food product sample produced from their farm or garden, and they may offer and add off-farm ingredients, such as an apple um, slice, and then they add commercially pre prepared caramel with it or um, a vendor at a craft or a food show offers samples of a product that they are selling. Uh, this couple here, um, this couple here is sampling uh, um, some grains that they produced um, it, and made into cereal. And I happened to sample it, and of course I bought the cereal, it was delicious. If you've ever been to a, state fair or expo, you likely see people um, selling cookware and individuals, they may make use their cookware and make up, um, make up a food sample. And really what they're trying to do is sell more cookware, right? Or there may be an education or a nutrition focus to the food sampling. So here educators are sampling um, nutritious food I don't know what keeps going forward to promote food preparation and nutrition co concepts at a community health fair. Or you may have a chef that's demonstrating a preparation technique and offers a sample as a way to get people to try and try something new. So now let's take a look at some best food sampling venues. A regional farm market sampling survey of 3,400 respondents from eight states Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Ohio, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia found the five most popular venues to offer food samples are uh, at community farmer markets, at grocery stores, at club stores where you actually pay a membership fee like a Sam's or a Costco, an on-farm retail market, or at a festival or event. So in the chat box, if you wouldn't mind sharing your experience with food product sampling, either as a customer or a vendor. So I'll give you a minute to type in your food sampling experience.
And Scott, for some reason, I'm not seeing responses. Oh, here we go. They got, they're starting to come in now. Uh, we sample products, generally snack mixes at Pride of Dakota events from Laura. Thank you. Uh, Nancy doesn't have any experience with um, selling or sampling product. I know here in um, Minnesota, our, our SNAP educators are very involved in um, sampling at farmers markets as well too and helping out. So if you don't have time to um, sample your product, you may want to look for other resources that could help you out, maybe a 4-H club or um, again, um, nutrition educators, um, family friends. Let's see, Ashley says we've sampled our jellies at farmers markets and vendor shows, excellent. All right, well, feel free, I'm gonna continue on, but feel free if something comes to mind, um, go ahead and put it in the, in the chat. So what to sample? Um, sampling is one of the most commonly used marketing techniques in the food business uh, to in showcase a product and ultimately increase the sales of that product. Uh, Kentucky research found that 55% of the farm market patrons who sampled the product purchased the product when they hadn't planned on it. So it really does um, help increase the sales of that product. The regional farm market sampling survey from the eight states that I mentioned earlier found favorite items customers like to sample are fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, cheese, and baked products. Uh, customers want to sample what you are selling, so try to keep it simple. If um, samples um, are complementary of each other and you're selling both, you can um, sample one or two items, but again, try to keep it simple. If you have more than three or four items, it's a lot of work for you and it also is um, hard for the, the consumer to really narrow down and pick, pick their fav favorite, especially if it's like five different types of jams. So keep it simple both, both for you and for your customer. So when um, to sample, a way to decide when to sample is really um, to look at traffic patterns from previous events or check with the event planner. Uh, when are the busiest times that that's the best time to sample? And also um, taking into consideration the holiday weekends, a lot of times people are coming through um, your area and will stop at markets, or if there's events in the area that may um, draw people or it may detract people from the, the market or the event that you're sampling at. So a survey at 11 farm markets in Kentucky found um, these were the top reasons why people try food samples. Uh, one is the friendliness of the vendor. So they're very inviting, engaging, and pleasant. Um, it's easy to get and access the food samples. Uh, it's a really nice um, presentation of the samples and displays. They're attractive, it's not cluttered. They're curious about an unknown product or they're familiar with the product. Why don't patrons sample? That Kentucky survey um, found that people don't sample because samples are gone or they weren't available. The um, area was really crowded and hard to get to. Um, They're uncertain of the taste, uncertain of the ingredients, and then they had some food safety concerns. And this was followed by dietary restrictions or the product wasn't grown or prepared to their standards like organic or kosher. So what is uh, your greatest food safety concern with offering or tasting food samples? If you wanna, if something comes to mind, if you wanna type that in the chat box, that would be good. So Ashley said she sampled at um, her jellies at farmers markets and vendor shows. And Lucinda said grocery stores and, and winery. And if you have any food safety concerns or challenges, either to why, why you aren't, aren't, aren't sampling or providing samples or questions you might have or
feel free to type that, type anytime. Listeria concern for sure. All right. Thanks, Linda, for that comment. So we're going to um, now move on to uh, preparing food samples um, to address some food safety concerns, um, both that vendors have and um, tasters have. And so we're going to start with regulations. Um, Laura's saying, we stay away from sampling fresh fruit and veggies or other items that might need to um, need or do better with refrigeration. Really good point. So with regulations, um, they're gonna vary by location, venue, or state. So you wanna check with your local or state health department to find out what is and isn't allowed in your area. Um, and ask the question if, you're, if a license or a temporary permit is required for food product sampling. Um, like I said earlier in Minnesota, uh, samples that are offered um, by a vendor or through cooking demonstrations at farmer markets and community events um, are excluded from a food license. But there are requirements of our special food licensing um, event that have to be followed. And then you also wanna check with the venue too because they may have some approval process or other requirements as well. So displays and signage will help promote um, safe food sampling and then also inform the consumer. So when you're um, offering food samples, it should be offered under cover, so under a tent. Um, some people use an umbrella um, or in a building, but not from the tailgate of your truck. <laughs> a canopy or tent or other overhead protection prevents overhead contamination from birds or uh, wind, dust. And then you want to be strategic of where you locate your um, sampling stand. So you want to um, have it so that it protects from envir both environmental and human contamination. So separate it from bathrooms, porta potties, petting zoos, um, water um, drainage. Don't, so don't have it downhill um, that water um, could drain onto it. So place the stand on a surface to control dust and mud like concrete or asphalt is great. Um, if you're on grass, dirt or gravel, uh, cover that surface with a non-absorbent mat, rubber or sealed plywood to control contamination from mud or dust. And indoor venues are really great because they will take care of the overhead protection and also the flooring issue. And then signage uh, lets customers know that you're offering samples and will draw customers to your stand. Um, you can protect your signage by laminating it or put it in a plastic sleeve. Or I've seen people get really creative with chalkboards or um, whiteboards too. So let customers know what you are sampling and um, who is offering that sample. Um, so in this picture here, the vendor displays a lid of what the jam is being sampled and then who the farm is and then also the ingredients are listed there as well. Some markets, um, our venues will have a central sampling or demonstration stand and if that is so, making sure that you provide signage with the name of the producer, of the name of the product, and then um, who the organization that's also sampling and um, preparing those samples. Include a food allergy warning sign if your sample contains one or more of the big eight food allergens. And this really is very important for those um, people that have food allergies or intolerances or sensitivities. So the eight food categories that cause 90% of our food allergic reactions in the United States include peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, milk, egg, soy and wheat. 
So read ingredient labels to see if the product contains uh, any of the big eight allergens. If it does, be sure to post a food allergen sign. Like this one here for serving zucchini walnut bread, um, you'd want to put a sign that says contains eggs, wheat, milk, and walnuts. Hand washing is a key to providing safe food samples. In this section, you'll learn how to set up a temporary hand wash station, how and when to wash your hands. So remember that germs um, that can make us sick are invisible. Uh, we can't see them, but they may be on our hands, so hand washing is the most effective way to control and prevent cross-contamination and the spread of germs to food. If you prepare and provide food samples, you will need a hand washing station at your sampling stand. And you can bring and set up a portable temporary hand washing station uh, to the venue. To make a temporary gravity fed hand washing station, you will need a 5 to 15 gallon insulated thermos type container with warm water. That water should be from um, a public water supply or it can come from a private well that meets the state's health department safe drinking water and well water standards. The water needs to flow freely uh, through a turnstile or flip up spout, spout um, so that so there's a steady stream of water. So the push button thermoses would not work for hand washing. You will also need uh, soap and any kind of soap will do. Uh, bring paper towels and put the roll on a heavy stand so it doesn't blow away. You will need a five gallon bucket or a container to catch the dirty used water. You will need a trash can or a pail for paper towels. And you'll also need a table or a cart to put the hand washing supplies on and to elevate that water container off the ground so you can properly wash your hands. A health inspector told me once that um, she saw a temporary hand washing station on, on a curb. So that's not really um, accessible for hand washing. So when you arrive at the event uh, or venue, you want to set up the hand washing station first before unpacking other supplies and preparing food. The hand washing station is for you, um, the food preparer, not for your customers and your hand washing station needs to be accessible to all persons helping prepare and dispense the samples. You wanna locate the hand washing station so water does not splash on the food or food contact surfaces during the hand washing process, process which would contaminate the food. There needs to be enough water and supplies for everyone to last the entire time of, sampling, of a sampling session. So this is um, maybe new and very important. Um, you need to maintain enough water pressure in the container to adequately wash your hands. And so you'll need one gallon of water remaining in the container at all times. That's two inches above the spout or spigot. So you'll need to bring extra water to maintain this level in your dispenser. If you run out of water or it goes two inches, you'll need to stop sampling for the day. To help conserve water though, you can, um, after you wet your hands, after you wet your hands, turn off the spigot, apply soap, um, then scrub for 20 seconds, and then turn the spigot back on to rinse. So now we'll talk about when to wash your hands when you're um, during the sampling event. So wash your hands when you, before you start preparing your food, um, before you're serving samples, uh, beginning a new task. You're gonna wash your hands, of course, after using the restroom, after handling raw meat, poultry, and eggs, or your raw produce if you're uh, at, um, selling produce at the same time and bag that up for somebody and then get ready to um, prepare a sample, making sure you wash your, your hands in between. Um, anytime you're handling um, animals, eating, smoking, coughing, or blowing your nose, wash your hands after touching your hair, body, or face, wash your hands after handling garbage or cleaning, after shaking hands, handling money, or after using the phone. 
I'm just going to jump back to that. But take your time to wash your hands well. Um, customers will wait for you and they want to see hand washing done. Uh, remember that gloves, wet wipes, or hand sanitizers, or washing your hands in the dishwater um, are not substitutes for washing your hands. So uh, again, wash your hands often. If you do it when you're required to do it, every time, everything on this list, um, your trash can will show it. It'll be full of paper towels. So your health and hygiene also plays an important role in preventing foodborne illness. And so we're gonna look at some do's regarding um, your health and hygiene. So be sure to stay home if you're, if you're ill. Um, improper hand washing and working while ill or recently ill um, are major causes of foodborne illness. So you must not prepare or serve food samples if ill with vomiting and or diarrhea for at least 72 hours after symptoms end. So that's three days after you recover. You should not be um, preparing food samples. Train your volunteers and workers to report illness and to stay home if ill. Um, make sure that you're washing your hands often and do it right. Rub and scrub for 20 seconds with soap and water. And then clothing, um, bacteria can harbor in clothing. So do wear clean clothing. So if you're out in the, the garden or, um, and harvesting produce, um, making sure that you're changing your, your clothes or putting on a clean apron when you're preparing your food samples. Do keep your fingernails short, trimmed, and filed. Uh, bacteria and viruses can lodge in long and uneven nails. And if you're preparing food, uh, don't wear fingernail polish or acrylic nails as they can chip and become a hazard. And do check hands, wrists, and forearms, forearms for any cuts and wounds. And then you want to cover those cuts with a bandage and then also wear single-use gloves. And the reason for this is because Staphylococcus aureus can harbor in cuts. And this bacteria is not destroyed by cooking or heat. And then finally, um, keep hair out of food by wearing a hat, visor, or scarf, and then put long hair in a ponytail. No one wants uh, hair in their food sample. And a few don'ts regarding health and hygiene. Don't eat or drink while preparing and serving pro um, food product samples. And this is because of the risk of hand-to-mouth contamination and saliva can spray from chewing or swallowing onto food or food contact surfaces. Uh, don't wear rings, watches, or jewelry on your hands uh, or arms as they are a major source of contamination. Um, personal items like cell phones and purses should be kept off and away from food preparation tables and areas as they are also a major source of contamination. This happens to be my daughter. We, she was helping at a uh, rot cell for her, her uh, high school graduation party. <laughs> and I caught a picture of her on her phone with her gloves on. <laughs> so preparation of samples, we'll move into that next, um, highlighting some safe food handling practices for um, preparing and serving us food samples. So planning really is your first step and key to providing safe food product samples. You wanna think through preparation steps for each sample. So think about how you will wash, cut, assemble, cook, bake, cool, keep cold, heat, cook, keep hot, store, portion, and serve, serve the samples. So think through your equipment needs also for each step to prepare your sample on site. How will you safely transport and sort and store food and equipment to and at the venue. Now, totes really work well with covers and you can make a portable kitchen to bring to the venue. So where you prepare your samples will, be, will depend upon um, who you are. If you uh, carry a food license, like a licensed bakery, or you are a cottage food producer, you can prepare your samples on site. Um, other than cottage food, you cannot prepare food samples in your home or to transport to the event. You could use a licensed commercial kitchen to prepare the sample and bring it to the venue for sampling. 
um, just make, make sure you check with that kitchen because they will have different requirements and some require you to be a certified food manager, which requires more training to use their facilities. Um, so most farmer market um, vendors that are do um, food sampling or food demonstrations will prepare their samples on site at the venue. So be sure to bring enough equipment and utensils to prepare your samples on site. You'll want to bring enough um, so that you never have to reuse a dirty item or you can wash the equipment at the market for reuse during the sampling or food demonstration event. Um, be sure to store your totes, coolers off the ground on pallets or tables, shelvings, again, to prevent from dust um, contamination. Store food and equipment away from chemicals, including sanitizer, sunscreen, insect sprays. Those are things we sometimes forget that can contaminate food. But no matter where, um, oops, I think I skipped the, sorry, <laughs> my um, PowerPoint's jumping around for some reason. So we're going to uh, focus a little bit on produce because um, remember people like to sample fresh produce and it's the most commonly product sampled at a farmer's market. But if you sample um, produce, you'll need to wash all fruit and vegetables under running water before peeling, cutting, or serving. You, you have two options. One is to wash the produce in a licensed commercial kitchen or um, two, you can wash that produce on site at the market. No matter where you clean your produce, you want to make sure that you're following these steps um, to avoid contamination. Uh, wash your hands before and after handling fresh produce. Wash all fresh um, produce under running water before cutting or preparing it, including those with skins and rinds like melons. Uh, scrub fruits and vegetables with a firm skin like apples, carrots, cucumbers with a clean produce brush to remove any dirt and microbes. Um, pull apart any leaf, leafy vegetables like um, broccoli to make sure that you're um, really washing all surfaces. And then you want to rinse well and then drain your produce in a colander or a salad spinner um, really works well to remove moisture. But if you clean produce on site at the market or your event location, Use water from your hand washing station to bring a uh, or bring a separate container for washing produce. If you use the hand washing station, you'll need to uh, have two catch buckets, uh, one to collect the hand wash water and one to collect the produce wash water. Uh, this pre prevents the splashing of contaminated water collected from hand washing onto the produce, produce if you're washing. Some markets or events may have a central produce washing station for vendors to use, so check uh, with the market manager or event organi organizer on availability. So to avoid contamination of the, of the produce you just washed, you want to make sure um, you're applying some safe food handling practices. And this includes not touching the produce with your bare hands. So um, creating a barrier um, between the produce and, um, and your hands. So you could wear gloves, uh, single um, service utensils, the tongs, or um, use a non-absorbent deli tissue or wax paper. And then making sure that you're um, using a cutting board that's only used for produce, so there's no risk of cross-contamination between raw um, poultry or meat, and that anything that you're using to prepare that produce sample is clean, so your um, peelers, knives, and salad um, spinners, and then cut away any damaged or bruised areas because they can contain pathogens. And then finally, after you're done preparing your samples, what are you gonna do? Wash your hands.
there's a lot to preparing uh, food samples, isn't there? So now we'll talk about um, time and temperature. So perishable food product samples need time and temperature control for safety. And this is the temperature danger zone. And the temperature of the food is critical for safety. This um, thermometer shows that the temperature danger zone where bacteria likes to grow and thrive is between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if perishable food is kept in this temperature range for more than four hours, bacteria can grow and multiply and make someone sick. To prevent this from happening, um, thermometers are our friend. Thermometers happen to be a very important tool to check food and equipment temperatures. So you can um, purchase and buy appliance thermometers from a variety of stores, um, put them in your cooler, and then bring and use calibrated food thermometers to check cold holding, uh, cooking and hot holding temperatures of your food product samples. Uh, check the temperature of the food with food thermometer at least every four hours to ensure that it's at the proper temperature. Uh, if the food is, um, falls in that temperature danger zone over 40 to 140 degrees, you should throw it away, discard it. If you're having to um, do any cooking of meat, poultry, or um, fish, you want to make sure that you're cooking it to a safe final cooking temperature and verify that with a food thermometer. There's only three temperatures to remember dep um, depending on what you're cooking. Uh, 165 degrees for all poultry products, 160 degrees for ground meat and egg dishes, and then there's 145 degrees um, for um, fish, um, pork, and steak if they're uh, roast or chops. And, um, but the big thing there is that you want to make sure that you let it rest for three minutes so that the entire product um, is 145 degrees. Now these are minimum internal temperatures for food safety. You um, can cook all these products to a higher temperature. Once the product is fully cooked, uh, you want to keep hot foods hot at 140 degrees or hotter. Uh, you can use hot plates, electrical skillets, or pro propane grills to cook and keep hot food hot. Um, don't use a domestic slow cooker or household slow cooker to hold hot foods because every time you lift off the cover, it takes 20 minutes to heat back up. But a commercial food grade or food service grade warmers do work really well to keep your hot food hot. And then you also want to keep safety in mind as well. So you check with the market or event manager about local electrical and fire code requirements. For example, if you're using a propane tank greater than 20 pounds, you may be required to get a permit from the local fire department. Um, whenever you're cooking, a fire extinguisher is required. Um, and for grills and, fi and fryers, uh, they need to be roped off four feet from the public to prevent injury from burns and splashes of hot grease. So now let's focus on cold food. What equipment do you need to keep cold foods below 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Coolers are allowed to hold cold food uh, if you're holding it for less than four hours. If you, you'll be over that four hours, then um, you'll need mechanical refrigeration. Electrical coolers, electric coolers with battery packs are um, plug-ins. They are considered mechanical refrigeration and will work. Uh, coolers need to be durable, leak and absorbent proof, um, cleanable with a tight fitting lid. You want to fill your coolers with ice packs or ice jugs. Uh, don't use bags of ice as they can leak and become a source of contamination as the ice melts. Place an appliance thermometer in each cooler you use. Uh, the food of the cooler should be at 40 degrees or colder, so you want that appliance thermometer to read 36 to 38 degrees. Depending on what you're sampling, you may need to have more than one cooler. You should have a cooler for raw products 
and a separate cooler designated for ready to eat products. Plan ahead so that you have enough cooler space for all items that need to be kept cold. If you're serving a, a beverage that you need to add ice to, like a kale smoothie, you'll need an additional cooler for the ice. Uh, use ice purchased from a commercial source. Uh, because of the risk of contamination, don't use ice from your home freezer or your home um, refrigerator ice dispenser. Use an ice scoop to dispense ice. Have a container to hold the scoop when not in use. Don't keep the scoop in the ice, um, in the cooler, as the handle um, can contaminate the ice. So let's move into, you prepared your samples safely, so now let's talk about dispensing those samples safely. You want to use single service items like toothpicks and plastic spoons, uh, which cause customers to throw away after consuming the sample. Place a Toothpick and an apple slice provide plastic spoons for jelly samples. Put bread um, samples in a cupcake liner or on a small plate. And then space those samples um, apart so um, customers don't touch the other samples when they pick up their sample. And then do not prepare or dispense food samples with your bare hands. We talked about that a little bit with the produce. You want to create a barrier between ready to eat food in your hands. So on this slide, you'll see several examples of good barriers to use. Um, gloves are the most commonly um, used, but you can use, again, um, non-absorbent deli papers, uh, wax paper, tongs, scoops, knives, um, labels, depending on the product you are sample, sampling. Uh, don't use paper towels or napkins because the, they, um, they are absorbent. So in the next few slides, we're gonna look at some safe and uh, unsafe dispensing practices. So this actually um, is a safe dispensing practice. The samples are covered with a dome to protect from environmental contamination. They're labeled with um, what the sample is um, and who is providing the samples. Uh, the melon salsa, though, does need time and temperature control for safety. So best practice is to place just a few um, salsa samples out at a time and replenish when gone. Um, monitor the time you place the samples out and limit the time that it's out. Um, keep any unportioned um, salsa in a cooler or under refrigeration. And then I would also add a allergy alert sign for that zucchini bread um, if it contains tree nuts, eggs, soy, and or wheat. So this is an unsafe dispensing practice. Um, it's uncovered, it's prone to environmental and customer contamination. It's unlabeled with the name of the sample and source. Um, but what can we do to make this sample safe? Um, we could put the samples on individual napkins or plates or provide tongs. Um, the chopped tomatoes for the bruschetta requires temperature, um, time and temperature to control it for um, pathogen growth, so keep track of time. We could cover um, the container with plastic wrap to protect it from uh, environmental contamination. And then we could label with the name of sample and source. And then we would wanna have a food allergy alert sign for the bread if it contains wheat. Uh, this is a really safe dispensing practice of apple slices. They're in individual servings with a single service utensil in each cup. Um, the cups are well spaced out. Um, vendor has control over the samples. That's her arm there, so she's holding it. So instead of signage, um, you as a vendor, you can verbally explain uh, what the sa sample is, um, what's in it, and who it came from. And these are uh, sausages in, this, in cups. Um, this is a safe dispensing practice uh, they're in individual uh, servings with a single service toothpick in each sausage. Mm -hmm. There's a small amount that are displayed at a time. Um, but it, 
you want to keep the unportioned um, sausages hot until serving. People want to try if the food should be hot, it should be hot. That's what people want. Same with cold food. Uh, there's signage with the name of the samples and source. Uh, again, I'd add, add a food allergen alert sign if needed because um, some sausages may contain wheat as a filter, as a filler, or soy um, as a flavoring. So it's really important that you read um, the ingredients that you use to prepare your food samples so that you know um, what's in it and if there's any um, ingredient that's in that top eight allergens. So we prepared everything safely, we're dispensing it safely, and now we want to make sure that we're cleaning and sanitizing um, as well. So all equipment, food contact surfaces, and utensils uh, that you bring to the market must be cleaned and sanitized. You can bring enough uh, equipment that you never reuse a dirty item, or you can wash the market um, for reuse during your sampling or food demonstration event. You can set up a dishware and utensil washing station. Um, and what you would need to do there is to have three uh, containers, bucket pails, bins, or tubs. Uh, they should be food grade, which means they're designed to hold food or food contact surfaces. So don't use buckets that previously contained chemicals or any of the top food allergens like ice cream buckets because you can't um, thoroughly remove all of that. All of that could still contain some, allerg some allergen in it. Uh, the containers need to be large enough so the largest item you will be washing can be fully immersed under water in the container. Uh, you also need an area to place a dish rack for air drying. Um, be sure that the containers are on a table. Uh, do not place the containers on the ground as they're, again, a potential source for dust and mud to contaminate the buckets. And again, it's not going to be accessible to do a good job at washing those dishes. A dishwash station needs to be away from the hand washing station to prevent contamination from the splashing of the dirty water into the dishwash buckets. Prepara preparation and serving utensils and surfaces need to be washed at least every four hours. Label uh, the first bucket as your wash bucket. Uh, so you're going to fill that with hot water and soap. And label the second rinse and you're going to fill that with clean hot water. And rinsing is really important to remove soap. If you have soap residue um, on your utensil, uh, the sanitizer won't be able to penetrate and, to the surface and kill the germs. And then you're going to label that third bucket um, with a sanitize, sanitize and fill with warm water and add sanitizer. The three water, um, the water containers um, should be changed every two hours or more often depending on use. So you're going to need to bring extra hot water. Uh, if you need to change your water, you also need to have containers to store that dirty water. And when you run out of water for dishes, uh, you should stop sampling. Chlorine, bleach, iodine, and quaternary ammonia are the most commonly approved sanitizers for food and food con or for food contact surfaces. The approved sanitizers have an EPA registration number and, and instructions to um, sanitize food contact surfaces. So that's what you're looking for on the label. Uh, this household bleach has instructions for use on laundry and disinfecting floors, walls, and sinks but there's no instructions to use um, it to sanitize food contact surfaces. So you should not be using it um, on sanitizing dishes and utensils. So again, you wanna follow the manufacturer's instructions on um, how to mix it up and use that chemicals. And the concentration is very important. So too much can be toxic and too little can um, not be effective in killing pathogens. So if you're gonna use bleach um, as a sanitizer, the recipe is one tablespoon of chlorine ble bleach to one gallon of water. So this is the last uh, section here. The final topic is disposing of the waste you collected during your sampling event. 
You are responsible for safe disposal of all the water and materials you use to prepare and serve food samples. This includes the paper towels and water from washing hands, water from dishwashing, and containers used to dispense the samples. So if you have any grease, allow it to harden and place it in a garbage container. Uh, waste water and grease cannot be poured on the ground, in creeks, ponds, rivers, in the street or down um, street or storm drains because the water does not go through a wastewater collection system. But this improper disposal method can contaminate water, the environment, and attract pests. At the end of the day, place all the garbage and paper waste in a container with a tight fitting lid, collect the wastewater, cover it, transport it, and dump in a designated wastewater collection system like a sink drain will work. Just like camping, if you bring it in, bring it out. Um, some bigger markets and events will provide um, liquid or solid waste containers for your use, so check uh, with your venue about what they provide. I know that was a lot of information. Um, hopefully I didn't scare you away from trying um, sampling. Um, it can be a lot of fun and it can also really um, increase your sales and promote um, nutrition and other messages as well too. So we, on our University of Minnesota Extension website, we do have a lot of great resources for you to check out, in, including that four-part series recorded presentation. If you want to listen to that, there's more details that I didn't cover in this presentation. But again, we have a, a checklist, a tip sheet, and the Minnesota Farmers Market Association actually put together a safe sampling worksheet. So it actually helps you plan and think through all those steps that we just covered. And they also have a hand washing station. Um, checklist as well too, and directions on how to retrofit a thermos with a push, uh, with a push button um, to a flip up spout, uh, a hands-free spout. So, so check that out if you're interested. And here's my contact information. Feel free to contact me at any time with questions um, or let me know what you're doing as far as food sampling. I love to hear stories and I'd love to see some pictures on what you're doing as well. And I'll take, away, take any questions that you might have.